I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is impeachment. Are you ashamed of the words that you wrote down? President Swalwell, I'm very happy of what I've written, but you're welcome to read it if you'd like. California Congressman Eric Swalwell, a key member of the Intelligence Committee, is with us from Capitol Hill. Plus, the issue is whether the Democratic Party has the guts. Bernie Sanders on brand for us at the Democratic debate. But did this debate shake up the race at all? We'll debate that and more with quite a panel. Check them out there. Tommy Lahren, Ariva Martin. Are you ready for this? The issue is starts right now. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the president's potential impeachment continues to dominate the conversation. Joining us now from Capitol Hill is Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell. He represents the Bay Area in Congress. And he's a member of the House Intelligence Committee. Congressman, welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, so the impeachment question. You've heard a lot of evidence. You've heard a lot more evidence than most people because of some of these, uh, these meetings that you've been in. Based off of what you hear, have heard so far, is there any way that Democrats don't impeach President Trump? Well, the president's going to get a, a fair hearing, and, and that is going to be the case even though he has confessed to it and Mick Mulvaney has co-signed that confession. But just to kind of lay out what we're looking at here, you have a crime of possibly extortion, bribery, soliciting a foreign government uh, to help your campaign. It doesn't seem to be that there's much dispute about the crime. You have the president uh, essentially on that call record asking the Ukrainians to investigate his opponent and leveraging the aid to the Ukrainians unless they did that. And then yesterday, Mulvaney, of course, confirmed that. And we, ha we have a cover-up. So crime, confession, ongoing uh, cover-up and efforts uh, to prevent Congress from learning what's going on. He still is entitled to a fair hearing. He's going to get that, but we're going to move as expeditiously as possible because of the stakes of an upcoming election and national security implications. Have you heard enough evidence so far to vote for impeachment? Well, I, again, I want to make sure that the, the hearing uh, is fair. I was a prosecutor before I came to Congress, and even in cases where the suspect confessed to the crime, it was import, important because of our system of law and the rule of law that people get a fair process. So I want to make sure that, you know, we hear from the witnesses. And, and you know, Alex, we've asked them, the White House and the State Department, to provide witnesses and documents, and they refuse. And so we can only conclude that that is a consciousness of guilt. Part of the reason that they are refusing, they say, is because there has not been an official vote in the House for in, uh, an impeachment inquiry to begin. Um, even if that's not required, why not have a vote, if you have the votes, and just to take away that talking point? Well, in the history of investigations, no investigator has allowed a suspect to dictate the terms and the timeline of an investigation, and we're not going to let Donald Trump do that. And, you know, we're not interested in talking points. We're interested in, you know, the evidence and the Constitution and the oath that we all swore. And we also are mindful that Donald Trump is Lucy with the football here. If we had a vote that we're not required to have just to satisfy Donald Trump, he'll come up with a new reason the very next day as to why he's not going to cooperate. The key thing that Democrats have identified as a problem is President Trump withholding uh, aid from Ukraine. But there was an incident a few years ago when Joe Biden was vice president himself where he talked about the U.S. withholding aid to Ukraine. We want to play this and then get your reaction. Yep. And I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to the press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of, <laughs> got fired. What, what do you see as the difference between those two? It's a fair question. The difference is that at the time and still today, the official foreign policy position of the United States was that aid for Ukraine would require Ukraine to root out corruption. And the prosecutor that the vice president was referring to uh, was widely viewed internationally as a corrupt prosecutor. And so the vice president was executing the stated foreign policy of the United States. Here, the president in that phone call with President Zelensky of Ukraine is not talking about corruption writ large in Ukraine. He is talking about the Bidens and investigating the 2016 election, which essentially would exculpate Russia. So. There's a big difference. The vice president was acting in the interest of the United States taxpayers. Donald Trump was acting in the interest of his upcoming election. 
Uh, there's a lot of other issues we could go on impeachment all day, but there's also a lot of big issues uh, back home. And one of the biggest issues back home is what's going on sure. with PG&E, uh, where more than a million Californians uh, had their power taken off preemptively out of fears that uh, these lines could spark a fire like what we've seen in the past. Is this a sustainable process where for all the months where there's potential fire danger, people are just in the dark? And, and is there something that went wrong with the management and the regulation of PG&E from the Democrats in California that created this situation in the first place? Well, what, we can't live this way. PG&E has to make clear to the taxpayers that we are spending wisely uh, to prevent future uh, fires caused by, you know, wind debris being blown uh, into their transmission lines. And they need to move quickly. I, I don't think there should be any bonuses for anyone at PG&E. I think all of the money right now needs to be spent on hardening uh, their systems. And it's unacceptable uh, that we would have any more fire seasons uh, like this. Another big story this week, the debate uh, between the presidential candidates. Of course, you were on stage for the first presidential debate. Uh, I'm wondering sort of what goes through your mind when you watch one of these debates and sort of what were some of the most important takeaways for you from actually running for, for president? I very much enjoyed watching that debate from my couch. And my wife asked me, she said, are you thinking in your head of how you would answer each of these questions? And I told her, no, I'm thinking in my head how relieved I am that I don't have to answer these questions and I can evaluate these candidates as someone who would work with them uh, in Congress and also as a father of two kids who cares deeply about what their policy means uh, for our families. But you're not ready to endorse yet? No, no, no. And, you know, actually, yeah. I've, I've talked to many of them privately about gun safety, which is an issue I'm really passionate about. And I enjoy, you know, j just seeing that issue elevated uh, on the debate stage. Sure. OK, well, when you are, come make news on the issue is. But something else we like to do on the issue we'll is, is that we like to have some yeah. fun. So we're going to play a game. This is called Good. either or. So this is where you, you got to answer either <laughs> okay. this or either that. OK, a rapid fire here. Uh, OK. Giants or A's? Oh, uh, Giants, but we love the A's. Okay. We love the A's, but Giants. you got to pick one. Friends or Seinfeld? Friends. Beer or tequila? Ooh. You know, I was at an airport bar, and I ordered a beer, and the guy asked me if I wanted for $5 a tequila shot, and I said, why not? So I think I can take both on that one. Oh, there you go. Big man. Uh, and finally, this was the week yeah, of the Rock yeah. and Roll Hall of Fame upselling. nominations. Yeah. Uh, so two of the nominees this week. Okay. Dave Matthews Band or Doobie Brothers? Ooh, I'm going to go Doobie. Full Doobie, Doobie Brothers. I'm surprised the man your age would pick Doobie Brothers. But we've got a little Doobie Brothers for you. Uh, taking it to the streets, which I think go. is that good for a politician, right? <laughs> Congressman Eric yep. Swallow, thank you so there much. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Our All thanks, right. Congressman Swallow. By the way, we reached out to the White House and the Republican leadership in the House, inviting them on the show to respond. They told us they didn't have time this week, but we hope to have them on soon. But we have one conservative perspective coming up right here. Tommy Lahren is here. So is Ariva Martin. They're ready to take it to the streets. Big debate is next. From Southern California to the Bay Area, you're watching The Issue Is. Things have just gone from very, very bad to much, much worse. A phenomenal breach of the president's duty to defend our national security. California Congressman Adam Schiff responding to the White House admission about pressuring Ukraine. Speaker Nancy Pelosi says Schiff has really taken the lead on that impeachment probe. Should the president be impeached? Let's debate that more with our panel. Two returning all-stars, Ariva Martin is an attorney, activist, host, philanthropist, and author. Her newest book is called Make It Rain, How to Use the Media to Revolutionize Your Business and Brand. Tommy Lahren is a host on Fox Nation and one of the most influential conservatives in social media in the whole country. Her newest book is called Never Play Dead, How the Truth Makes You Unstoppable. Both great books. Uh, great to have both of you here on together for the first time. You ready for this? Let's do it. Let's have some fun. Okay. Let's do it. All right, so let's start with the opening question. Uh, counsel, should the president be impeached? Yeah, I think there's been a pretty persuasive case made for impeachment. 
when you look at the phone call, when you look at the, the July phone call between uh, Trump and the president of the UK, Ukraine, you look at the readout of that call, you look at the comments made by Trump himself, and the, what we're hearing about these witnesses that are giving deposition testimony, I think there's a very persuasive case uh, that Trump has committed high crimes and misdemeanors and that the Democratic Congress is ready to... Uh, you know, file articles they're of ready impeachment. They're a lot of things, but they're not ready to take a vote on it. So they don't actually have to be put in a position where this could affect their election chances. So we just want to talk about it, keep talking about it, keep having that be the discussion of the country without actually moving forward. If you're so confident, take a vote, then let's move forward. Are you but concerned, though, with the substance of, of what the president has admitted, which is that he asked the president of Ukraine to investigate his political opponent, the, the Bidens. Are you concerned about that? Is Listen, that a good precedent? I would have preferred that our president didn't do that, but our president wanted to root out corruption, which is something when Biden was vice president, he was tasked with rooting out corruption in Ukraine. We know that that went sideways. Congress does not have an obligation to have a vote on an impeachment inquiry. That is not in the Constitution. The and you can't not. make up, well, you can't make the up the rules as you go. And the Democratic Congress, the majority, just like if the Republicans were in majority, get to decide how that inquiry process works. So there's nothing constitutionally require, requiring this wouldn't vote. Wouldn't that make and your side, wouldn't that make the justification no, for it? If, what, if you're the, so confident, why not take a vote? Because this is the issue that Republicans don't get. This is an investigation. And once this investigation is completed, then the evidence will become public. And Donald Trump will have an opportunity to defend himself. His due process rights, as they continue to falsely uh, state, he's not been deprived of his due process rights. And to your point about if you're so confident, why doesn't Donald Trump just come out and release all the information rather than say, I'm going to obstruct, obstruct, obstruct. I'm not going to respond to any legitimate subpoena from the Congress, which has a constitutional duty for oversight. So if there's so confidence this, in the president, it, release the document. Take your vote, because he knows that there are vulnerable Democrats who are in areas that can flip red, blue, and they don't want to put their neck out on the line and go for impeachment. They don't want to say to their constituents that that's what their priority is. That's why Nancy does not want to take this vote. Donald Trump knows that, and he's playing them like a fiddle. There's absolutely no evidence for that. We see the number of Democrats that have come out in favor of impeachment. And not only that, the latest Pew Research poll says that 54% of all Americans are in favor of impeachment. So we don't just have the Democratic Congress. We have all of America now. Those numbers have gone up steadily. You look back in September, those numbers were under 50%. Mm -hmm. Now they're at 54%. And it's not this witch hunt, as the Republicans like to claim. And it's not this Ukraine thing. It's a legitimate violation of the Constitution. 53% of Americans want to see impeachment. Then let's take the vote and let's see what happens. But they <laughs> know they know that their polls the polls also told us Hillary Clinton was going to be president you the the people of this country are behind their president they're going to elect him again I would like to see the Democrats do something else besides hunt this president maybe get something else done for this nation so for we could once. Get a whole lot done if the president wasn't obstructing justice and committing high crimes and misdemeanors okay it's amazing how we brought everybody <laughs> together on that all right well maybe music can bring people together we celebrate the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominees this week that's our theme this week so now how about this little notorious B.I.G. with Hypnotize. We're going to talk about the Democratic debate and hear from our focus group of undecided voters. Stay with us. I don't need lessons from you on courage, political or personal. Love is a battlefield, and so is the Democratic debate stage. We continue with music from our Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominees. Here's Pat Benatar, which if you can believe it, is Congressman Ted Lieu's all-time favorite. Once again this week, we brought together a focus group of undecided Democrats to the watch the debate here with us. Here are some of their takeaways. Who do you think won the debate? Elizabeth Warren. No one. No one. I'm going to go with no one, but if Elizabeth Warren did the best. Warren. Warren. She was <clears throat> steady as, as a rock. So I think Mayor Pete had his best, most breakout performance of all the debates. A yes or no question that didn't get a yes or no answer. I think that it was kind of refreshing to see him kick yes. it up a notch in terms of his level of just like being assertive, being aggressive. His level of aggressiveness, uh, I, I didn't appreciate it. It felt, one, it felt very scripted. To tell them where we're going to send the invoice. I thought Amy Klobuchar, um, I actually was quite impressed. I just felt her passion and her yes. fire. All right, so what did you at home? What did our panel think of the debate back with us? Tommy Lahren, Ariba Martin. Tommy, let's start with you. Your big takeaways from the debate. 
Big takeaway, the winner uh, was very clear. It was Donald Trump yet again. But uh, <laughs> um, He was, wins when he isn't even on stage. Well, absolutely. With these uh, 12 yeah. candidates, it wasn't hard. But at the end of the day, oh. as far as doing well, I'm glad that Mayor Pete kind of backed Elizabeth Warren into the corner on how she was going to pay and why she wasn't answering that question about raising taxes on the middle class. And then also backing Bernie Sanders in the corner again on their utopian dreams of socialism. How are you going to pay for all those things? So I think that he did a good job as far as Democrats. Democrats are concerned, and he really put Beto in his place, and I always like to see it. So I think Pete did a, a great job as far as Democrats are concerned. I got to send this to the Mayor Pete team. Tommy Laren <laughs> endorsing Mayor Pete. How about that? <laughs> I think we saw the other 11, okay? There we go. <laughs> well, I think we saw just a, a stage full of rock stars. I, I think it was <laughs> the Democrats at their best. There were great moments probably from every candidate that was on that stage. I, I think the women, which is so important to me as, as a woman and as a minority woman, to see women represented so well. Well, and I think little girls and women all over this country were probably sitting at home cheering, says, yes, I can be the president. I can do what these badass women are doing. So I think it was a great night for the, the female Democratic candidates. We know you on this show has, have backed Kamala Harris in yes, the past. Yes, I do. Um, we Very saw a proudly. bit of a, a fight between two of the leading women on this issue of whether President Trump's Twitter account should be suspended. Let's take a look at that. Twitter should be held accountable and shut down that site. It is a matter of safety and corporate accountability. What do you, what do you make it? Do you agree with her on that? Well, I do believe that Donald Trump, as Kamala Harris has, I think, so eloquently stated, is like a, a kid with a machine gun when it comes to how he uses Twitter. I question whether someone else that didn't have the title of president, if they engaged in the same kind of, uh, you know, if they had the same level of engagement and the kinds of tweets that Donald uh, Trump has become famous for, would that person still be able to utilize that social media but, platform? But and you, I would submit that that person would, would not. Yeah. I think they would be banned. We still have this great thing right now because we do exist under a Republican president and will again. We have this great thing called the First Amendment. The Democrats want to go out of their way to limit that. So from that debate, I, I took away something very important. It was control, tax, confiscate. They want to go after the First Amendment. They sure as heck want to go after the second. But the fact that we're having a presidential candidate sit on the stage and argue with another presidential candidate over whether Donald Trump should be banned from Twitter just shows out of, how out of touch the Democrats are with problems that are Whoa. affecting average Americans. Whoa. And to censor conservatives, I am a conservative. I exist in the social media world. We are already censored to such a high level. The fact that we've got Kamala on stage encouraging more of that is absolutely well, ridiculous. First of all, let's be clear about yeah. this. The First Amendment is is not and has never been absolute. You know that it has limits. Yeah. And when it gets into inciting violence, when it gets into this a provoking a racial division, this is such a then yes, slippery I think it's appropriate for a presidential candidate. I think it's appropriate so for anyone in a leadership position. To say that what Donald Trump tweets goes so far beyond that it's limited by the First Amendment, I think is lunacy. But if that's the platform the Democrats want to run on, I wish him the best of luck. Okay. We continue yeah, I our, think we'll win on that. our rock and roll <laughs> Hall of Fame nominee theme, little Shaka Khan. Okay. All right. We want to encourage you to check out our The Issue Is podcast, where we have in our archives in-depth sit-downs with both Tommy Laren and Ariva Martin. Coming up next, a final word about nepotism and corruption. Stay with us. I love, I love Shaka. I know. I know. Welcome back. This week, the White House announced that the G7 summit next year will be held at the president's own property, Doral in Miami. That announcement comes as the White House criticizes the Biden family for profiting off their own government service. Is this hypocritical or is it no big deal? Back with our panel, Ariva Martin and Tommy Laren. Tommy, is this a bad look when the, the, the White House keeps saying it's not good to profit off of all this stuff and then do First this? First of all, I'm going to say... I think just to remove any of the discussion, don't do it. However, I will say this president, when we talk about profiting off of your name because you're the president, this president, because he is the president, has lost more money, has taken more heat on his brands, his family's brands, of course, Ivanka's brand. Everyone involved with the Trump name has taken a huge hit by him being the president. So to say that? that he's profiting off it. How do we look, know that? They haven't they, they released had, any of their tax returns. But they have to remove their name because people are vandalizing their stuff. Ivanka, the store's boycotting because they made, don't want Trump on it. Hey, Alec, if we could get those tax returns, yeah. we could, you know, see if this argument holds water. And by the way, the, Jared and Ivanka made $82 million last year. They're not profiting off of their president. They're not pro their brands are not no, profiting off of the president. No, but you said that they're losing money, and the point is oh, they, they made are. a whole lot of money. I, let me just say, this is the most corrupt 
administration that we've seen in modern day history. And it is a violation of the emoluments clause and it shouldn't happen. Okay. Uh, you know what? I just want to wrap things up. Even though you disagree on most everything, you're both so civil to each other, and I think that's well, great. Not and only I think that, that not be... only do we disagree on a lot of things, we agree on one thing that it's your birthday today. Oh, yes. And I know oh, that great. everybody <laughs> here wanted to celebrate your birthday. Oh. So <laughs> I believe oh, there is a... something to agree oh, on that you're yes. a great guy oh, and dear. happy wow. birthday. Look at that. Oh, thank you very much. That oh. is so sweet. Look at that crew. Oh, oh my God, we got a whole thing. All right, we'll come over here. Thank you very much. Look at this. And from our. Uh, the best of our Fox 11 newsroom here. And producer Greg's beautiful daughter. Hi, Maylin, how are you? Hi. Look, oh, a cake Look, with my face on it? Thank you to the team here. Thank you to everybody for making this possible. And uh, I guess thank you for watching The Issue Is. <laughs>